Please welcome to the stage the former CEO of Alliance, Glo Alliance Global Investors, Elizabeth Corley. <laughs> So, good afternoon now, just to remind you in this dark hall that it's afternoon and there is sunshine outside. Um, it's a real privilege and a real pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Denis, for thinking to invite me and for having an opportunity to talk to such an extraordinary audience of brave, courageous, forward-thinking people. The question I've been asked to address, really, before we have a conversation with Bertrand and Melissa is, can impact investing really help us in terms of inclusion. And if you think about that simple sentence, it's, it's loaded with assumptions of definition. So I just want to spend a minute explaining what I mean by impact investment and also by inclusion. Now, impact investment does what it says on the tin. It is an investment. It's not philanthropy. But it has an impact which is significantly beyond a financial return, whether that's for the environment or for social good. So it's an investment that intends to have an outcome that isn't purely measured in financial terms. Now, inclusion, very often people think about as diversity and inclusion, part of policies within companies and other institutions. In the context of social impact, I think it's really important that we think about it not purely in that way, but as a fundamental means of addressing inequality. Because if you think about the root causes of inequality, it is because people are left outside, outside the economic benefits, but also outside mind space that thinks of their needs. So in terms of the question, can investing for impact really affect inclusion and help address inequality? There's absolutely no doubt, yes, it can. That's not the real question we should talk about. The real question we should talk about is why is it not happening more? And where it does happen, why is it not having more impact? If you think about it, investing is a natural thing we do every single day. Investing has a consequence, whether it's financial, intended, unintended, the question is, why are we not thinking about a route to solving some of the major issues that we face in the world today, closing that gap on funding United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? Why aren't we doing it more? And it's very straightforward. It's all about good intention versus good action. We're living in extraordinary times. We heard this morning of uncertainty, questions, institutions are not trusted, if you're a chief executive, as I was for many years, you are always intending to do the right thing when you go into work every single day. In your mind, you're doing the right thing. But the question is, is something beyond the norm, something that's a bit new, does it get to the top of your to-do list? Or does it get displaced by the sheer challenge of running a company or an institution of other sorts in today's very demanding times? And part of the reason, I think, why we're not trusted more is because these great intentions do not always flow through into actions, which is why I admire so much what Didi and the other organizers are doing here. So how can we put impact investing higher up the to-do list? How can we address the barricade of reasons why people don't do it and the displacement of that good intention? Well, to kick off the discussion, I've got some thoughts for you. But I just want to put up my one slide, so my kind colleague behind will put up a slide for me. Thank you. Part of the challenge is we have a legacy of 20th century thinking. On the one hand, we give. On the other hand, we take. So philanthropy, which is vitally important, the brilliant work of the NGOs that we heard about yesterday and today, is absolutely vitally important. That's a giving. And many of us are very comfortable about giving. But when we talk about investment, we want to take, just as we want to take our salary. And the challenge for impact investment for social and environmental entrepreneurs is that they actually require something which is closer to venture philanthropy. And technology is playing a key role in impact investment. There are entrepreneurs out there, innovators, forward thinkers, who can help us change the world, help us close that gap to the Sustainable Development Goal funding, but they're not getting the support they need. 
They might get grants, which are fantastically valuable, but they need sustainable financing. And if you think it's difficult as a tech company to get financing, second, third, fourth stage, it's even more difficult when your bottom line isn't about getting to IPO, it's really about changing the world. So here are three thoughts to kick off our discussion. Number one, companies really can do something here. And I suspect the people in this room, the leaders in this room, work for companies who want to do something. And that is that you're thinking about purpose as a fundamental part of strategy. Not just to do good, but because it is very good for business. When you think about purpose, think about the role of social impact in that purpose, in your supply chain management, in your purchasing decisions, in the way in which you think about your charity of the year, your employee foundations, as well as giving grants, give the investment capital and the intellectual capital that can help social and environmental entrepreneurs exceed what they can do. The second thing to think about is when you do get that good intention to the top of the list, do something really important, which is think about the beneficiaries rather than your own intent. Very often, good intentions fail because we export our own vision of the world onto people living very, very different lives with very different backgrounds. So engage with the communities, engage with the projects that you're seeking to help, and have the humility to listen to what they really need, and then craft what you do. And the third thing is to think outside the box between the roles of public and private finance, individual finance, NGOs, and development institutions and seek to catalyze ways of bringing that money together. I'm a huge optimist, but I actually think sorting out what we do on impact investing isn't just nice to do. I think it's fundamental. It's fundamental to the way we re-envisage capitalism for the 21st century. It's fundamental to rebuilding not just trust, but enduring trustworthiness. And I'm absolutely convinced that with the day one event and the extraordinary people in this room, we can turbocharge some of those actions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. So now joining us on stage is Bertrand Badre. He is the founder and CEO of Blue Like an Orange Sustainable Capital. He has some very strong opinions about the impact investing space and the private sector, and uh, Elizabeth and, and him share some synergies, I believe. So my first question, and I'll address both of you with this, is what can we do um, to start to get the collective society and corporations to think of impact investing as just smart investing. It's just the way it should be, not as an extra thing that you should do as a CSR initiative or some kind of do-gooder type experience. Well, my, my answer is really one word. We have to do a revolution. Uh, I, I never thought I would say that once in my life, despite being born in May 68. Uh, I've been, a, I would say, an incrementalist for many, many years. I saw changes will happen step by step and it's going to be all right. Uh, I don't think it's going to work anymore. I think we really have to change the heart of the system. I'm afraid we have wasted the last crisis. We had a big crisis. The good news is that we are not dead. We are happy to be in this room today. That is positive, the big difference between now and the 1930s. The bad news is that we have consolidated the previous system. We have not invented the next one. And the next one, for the time being, relies only on the goodwill of few actors, maybe Alliance, maybe BNP Paribas and others. That is great, but you will not change the world with the goodwill of few actors. You have to change the incentives within the system. You have to discuss the boring stuff like accounting, reporting, rating, etc., which totally focuses on the short-term end of the spectrum today. So if we don't change this radically, I'm afraid it's going to be a real problem for climate, for social anger, for all the issues that we've been discussing since this morning. So I would completely agree that we need to change some fundamentals in the system. We've got an obsession with measuring what can be measured, not what really matters. So we ignore externalities, we ignore unintended consequences, we are suspicious of things that are how touchy-feely in, in the English word. So we have to start finding ways of bringing those considerations into what we do. So I was asked, and I think the reason Denis asked me here, is I was asked by the United Kingdom government to look at why social impact investing in the UK was so slow to take off. And we identified five major things we needed to do. 
One was around just creating market mechanisms to improve the flow. And those are market mechanisms. We know how to do it in other markets. We can do that. The second was basically about competence. If you look at how financial analysts are trained, they're not really even trained on environmental, social, and governance topics, let alone impact. So we're working with the CFA in the UK and the Institute in the US to look at the curriculum and continuous professional development so that we can start to think about externalities beyond the price of carbon. We also need to build confidence, which is around the track records and sharing information. One of the challenges is in a world which is risk averse and where proof and evidence are needed at every single stage in the short term, people are very scared about sharing failure or partial success, which means we don't collectively learn. We have to break that barrier and say sharing failures in the right way is really good, which brings the third point, better reporting, better measurement, better information. And we have a huge project working with the UK department responsible for accounting and reporting, working also, we hope, with, with the EU. Uh, Alliance is part of the EU Commission on uh, following up on the high-level expert group on sustainable finance. We really believe that we have to think about how we report, the terminology, the metrics. The fourth is really straightforward, simply better products. The industry taking responsibility for not using environmental, social, and governance topics as branding and marketing, but as really driving outcome. And the fifth thing is how do we build coalitions? That is the most difficult thing to do. So we gave advice to government. Government asked us to form a task force, which we've done. Um, when that task force finishes, where does that work go? Because there's no doubt at all, it's when you coalesce that energy and the brain power and the creativity that you make leaps in progress. Whether that counts as revolution or evolution, I don't know, but I certainly think it can be done. Yes, the problem is that it has to be done very fast. I agree. And it's very frustrating because we know these things will not happen fast. That's why I'm, I'm facing a real dilemma today. We know what we need to do. Uh, but we don't know how to get there, and that's a big issue. I, I think we are still stuck uh, with the heart of the, the neoliberal paradigm. Financial capitalism is still the dominant yeah. mantra of the world today. And it's not what is necessary to move into a more sustainable uh, world. <coughs> and we, we, we know that, but there is nothing in the system that makes a shift massively in that direction. Mm -hmm. So I hope that we'll reach some tipping point by adding all these efforts together. I hope it's not too late. Yeah. So Blue Like an Orange invests quite a bit in companies in emerging markets. But it, it's some places that is very, very risky uh, according, in, in some, in, from some viewpoints. What are some things that your firm does um, in, order to, in order to cross over some of those boundaries and to get people to actually give these companies in emerging, emerging markets a chance? I think there are very few riskless places in the world today. So let's start okay. this way. It was probably very risky to invest in subprime related product in 2006. <laughs> Nobody is blaming the US anymore for that. Well, if you do a bad thing in, in, in Peru or, or, or in Gabon, people say, oh, this is emerging market, you cannot trust them. So this being said, uh, I think it's important. Perception matters. People are still nervous with emerging market and everything we discuss about impact, ESG, etc is twice as difficult in emerging market as it is in advanced economy. And we have to be cognizant of that. We have also to be prepared not to impose a new vision of impact and ESG to this country. We don't have to rebuild a new Washington consensus. This is the right thing to do. This is impact. This is not impact. I think we have to build this together, and it's way more difficult. So the point is really, and that's the, the, the background to blue like an orange. I was managing director of the World Bank for, for several years, so I've seen how these big public institutions are doing or not doing things in, the, in that space. So in a nutshell, the, the vision of blue like an orange is to be a private World Bank to basically attract institutional money into emerging and developing economies at market rate, so you get your commercial returns, and on top of that, you have a measurable impact. That's, that's really the heart of, of the approach. And to address part of the perception issues, because people are nervous about the risk, they are nervous about compliance, they are nervous about long list that Elizabeth addressed, some right, some wrong, uh, we have a working agreement with the Inter-American Development Bank, which is a development bank for Latin America, where we work together to kind of ease the concern of investors. Yes, we are working with a public institution, we are doing things together, we are joining forces, but they don't guarantee anything. We are taking the risk. We are just working together, financing things together. So it's not a free lunch. So I think we have to get 
people used to the fact that you can, as uh, I won't remember his first name, the, the lawyer from New York said, you can do good and do well. It's not incompatible. And probably more importantly, it's probably related. You do good because you do well, and you do well because you do good. But it's difficult to convince people, so let's start by doing good, by doing well, and then try to build the causality between both. Yeah. So I think much of the audience is probably familiar with the kinds of companies that, that provide social or environmental positive impact. But do just for some people, to shed a little bit more light on that, are there any companies as of late that really stand out to you as doing groundbreaking things in the impact ecosystem? Well, maybe I'll, I'll start with um, some of the innovations in the banking sector because loan finance is much easier than if you get into equity or, or, or capital finance. And if I look at the Netherlands and I look at some of the, the, the programs that are done there, there's a particular bank that stands out to me where they're blending technology with social purpose, and that's Triodos Bank. And if everybody's ever looked at the Triodos Bank, it's really interesting. They crowd finance, they can crowdsource funding very often into community projects because if you're working in a community, this issue of working with people instead of doing things to people starts to get addressed immediately. So I think Triodos does some brilliant things. Um, there are other organizations, fund managers. Uh, it would be unfair to, to mention them, but I, I call out the banks because actually it's the banks themselves could do a huge amount more in terms of channeling some of their lending capability. Standard Charter does a lot in Africa and other emerging markets. Um, they are constrained. I think it's really good that in Europe, uh, the Prudential Authority for Insurance Companies has raised the question of whether the Prudential laws are right in terms of the risk they attach mm -hmm. to this. Um, it's very difficult for banks to do that because central banks tend not to. Now, if you could persuade the central banks to take a slightly better view in terms of some of the marginal capital allocation, that would be brilliant. No, I've, I've actually, this is one area where I've, I've spoken a lot. I was very happy to see that the ECB in the past few days has come out saying that they want to support the green market, which yeah. is very new. When I first mentioned this a few years ago, people say, yes, why green, why not blue or black or red or whatever? Not our problem. We are, we are indiscriminating and we buy everything and we don't want to, to favor anything. So I say, but all the EU members have signed the COP21 agreement, so it's not random to move on the green side. And I'm glad they're moving. So things, things are happening. The other point I want to mention, is it's interesting coming back to my point on emerging markets. We are working with uh, regional banks, small banks, not the big ones, but the local ones, which provide uh, gender-based finance, affordable housing finance, SME finance, etc. And a number of these banks, they do impact without knowing they yes. do impact. I'm giving them a name. They just do a good job. Yeah. They, oh my yeah. God, you're doing a good job. You can qualify for impact, great. So uh, it, it's important to, to realize that it's not just putting people in boxes. A number of people are doing the right thing, and if you could provide them with the right financing, then you close the loop. That, that is what gives me hope for the future. There are things happening. So we have to reach, as I say, the critical mass, the tipping point, so that as we discussed yesterday, uh, impact is not a nice box no. on the side, like when you go to a church and you give money at the collection and you feel better because you've given money at the collection. Impact should be the main box, and the rest is, should be considered impactless or unsustainable, not the other way around. So yeah. we have to mentally switch from this is a new norm. We are not an exception, a nice thing to have. And that's the challenge of the next 20, 30 years, I believe. Yeah. You would think that corporations, more companies would understand that if you don't create a sustainable business and, and a sustainable infrastructure and do something that has a positive impact in your surroundings, then your company is not going to last anymore. But it's not, it's not, it's kind of, it's still considered in some places um, an afterthought. Sometimes I wonder if some of it is just changing the language and the vernacular around it. What, what does impact even mean anymore? No, but it, it comes back to, to a point which was brilliantly made by Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, the chair of the Financial Stability Board before COP21. So I had the privilege to, to be part of the Financial Stability Board. We discussed a lot, uh, in particular climate, and he made a speech called The Tragedy of the Horizon. That's really what we are facing. That's why the, the, the model we are in doesn't fit the purpose. What does it mean with the strategy of the horizon? Basically, the trader is taking care of the next second. Uh, the CFO, and I've been a CFO for many years, is taking care of the next quarter. The CEO, probably the next year or the next two years. The central bankers, two to three years. And nobody's in charge of what comes next. And nobody, nothing in the system makes you, force you to think about what comes next. There is no incentive whatsoever. So we have to break, we have to defeat this tragedy of the horizon fast. Now, I think the good news is, if you look at, say, the United States, where you could argue that the lack of any 
com commitment to central policy is really negative. It's the fastest growing area of environmental investing and social investing. Uh, there are $8 trillion of assets under management in these strategies already. In Europe, the first half of this year, we saw 32 billion euros of flows into these funds. So I think there is an evolution happening because clients and customers are asking for it. And in particular, millennial uh, people who are getting more money now are demanding it. And women, as they become owners of their capital through inherited or their own efforts, are also much more sensitive to things that are not just simply financial return. So I think really that the, the gap, the break in the system is that the providers of product and the regulators of those providers are not doing sufficient to catch up with where the customer is already going. I think this is exactly critical. I don't think we will recreate capitalism. I don't think we will reinvent market economies. They do exist and they are strong enough that we cannot really change that. But we have to play market economy at what it does best, exactly. allocate resources where they are needed. And how do you force market economy to do the right thing? By, by basically playing with two forces. On the one hand, the regulatory framework, what do you have to do, what you cannot do, what you should do, and this is regulation. You have Solvency 2 for insurance, yep. Basel 3 for banks, and so on and so forth. So what is it good, and how can you put a little bit of impact, a little bit of long term, a little bit of all this in, in, the, uh, yeah. in the regulation? And I have plenty of issues with that. And the other one is exactly what you said, the market pressure. Yeah. At the end of the day, if you are clients, people say move. I remember one of the largest asset managers in the US told me, Bertrand, you're sustainable things. This is really bullshit. I don't give a damn. But the truth is that some of my clients start to ask, so let's talk. Yeah. I don't want to question his motivation. I'm fine, provided he does the good thing. So we have to play both uh, client pressure, the women, the millennials, etc., and on the other end, make sure the regulation does not prevent from doing the right thing, which it still does today. Yeah. And what if there was any hope for, is there any chance of changing or broadening the definition of what um, a company that is eligible for impact investing is. So we spoke a little bit about this last night at dinner. Could a company that maybe their service or their product doesn't have a positive social impact or isn't environmentally friendly, but in their operations they're doing something, they're employing homeless people down the street or they're only using clean energy in their operations. I mean, some of it I think is the, the, I, the framework for what a company or social enterprise or B Corp is, is very narrow. I think it's what Bertrand said. We've got to start thinking that impact is in every single thing we do. Every single company has impact. Every step. In every, every step. single piece. So purposeful companies who think about purpose as part of their strategy are having an impact. And we need to legitimize that. There will always be a role for very pure impact investing, whether it's environmental or social, there'll be a pure role for that. But in the mainstream, to mobilize trillions of dollars, which is what we need to meet United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, we absolutely have to reinvent our definitions of what we're looking for from companies and institutions to do. And I think those companies should be included. There should be a proper conversation with their investors about the good they're doing. And I know it's a little bit frustrating. A number of people say, yes, if we had a standard, etc., that would be easier. It was clearly designed. Uh, well, I don't think we are at that stage yet. No, no, and it would be probably detrimental to cast everything in marble today. I think it's great that you have a lot of initiatives, that people are testing things, etc. And in particular, now that I'm exposed to emerging markets, the vision of impact in emerging markets has, has very little to do with the vision of impact yeah. you can have in the Netherlands. When you're a Dutch pension fund and you finance the Dutch water flows, that's great. But it has very little to do with financing risky agricultural projects yeah. uh, in the middle of Africa, even if it's called impact on both sides. So I think we have to accept this kind of uh, moment where many things are, are happening all over the world. There is no master of the world. Even the UN cannot say this is it. So we have to get there. and. Hopefully, the standards will emerge, maybe different standards, actually, yeah. different approaches, etc., will emerge to a point where this will, as I say, become the norm in 20, 25 years, and the rest will mm -hmm. become, how, how can we have done this for so long? You know, there is a, a nice sentence that we discussed with Ronnie Cohen, whom you know, uh, who is the founder of APAX, and now he's really the, one of the persons that has been a, a, a sinker of impact. And uh, that's what I put in my book. And we, we highlighted the fact that the 19th century was a century of return. It was easy to grab earth, easy to dig for coal, easy to pollute. Nobody cared. So you got the returns. 20th, 20th century, we invented the risk return balance, which basically led to venture capital, private equity, etc. So that's great. That's where we are today, risk and return. Now, 21st century, we should add a third variable, which is impact. How do you combine risk, 
return and impact. Yeah. And that's, the, the, I think, the, the golden or the, the Goldilocks triangle of, of finance in the 21st century. That's where we have to go. Yeah. I agree completely. So we are out of time. So I have one more question. It's for Bertrand. Um, would you tell everybody what blue like an orange means, where that name came from? <laughs> Only because you're <laughs> wearing your orange scarf. That's why I'm having a scarf despite yeah. the heat of the room. <laughs> No, Blue Like an Orange is a reference to uh, a poem from Paul Eluard, a French surrealist poet uh, from the 1920s, who wrote Earth is Blue Like an Orange, at a time where nobody had a clue that Earth would look blue from the sky. And this vision that Earth is also as fecund and fragile as an orange was extremely appealing to me. And, and uh, there is two footnotes to that. First, there is also a reference to Tintin and the mystery of the blue oranges, because I'm a great fan of comics and graphic novels. And the second subtitle is that this name is very strange. So uh, I made the bet, and so far, thank you, because I was about to lose, that every time I'm on stage or pitching, etc., it's either the first or the last question. Why? Your name is weird. Why are you called Blue Like an Orange? Oh, I forget to ask you, why Blue Like an Orange? So it's a wonderful icebreaker. Thank yes, you. absolutely. Did the trick. All right. Thank you both for joining thank me. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. I'm going to welcome Leila back to the stage for the next session. Thank you. Thank you.